we are now sharing a screen. We are at last recording. Um, I'm going to turn my video off just to save on some bandwidth. Uh, what I've done, just for anyone watching this back, uh, even if you're watching it back on YouTube, you can still access these. Uh, if you want to use the exact same 3D model as me in Rhino, you can navigate to the session in uh, Microsoft Teams. So it's this one, big style diagramming or BR Kingle style diagramming. Uh, navigate to the files tab and you'll be able to download the same 3D model that I'm going to use for today. So it's this Barcelona Pavilion complete model. It's a Rhino 7 file. So if you're using an older version of Rhino, it's not going to work. Um, but just for today, even if you just model a few cubes, the process will still work. You still get the concepts of what we're going to do. Um, let me just triple check we are definitely recording. Yes, we are. Right, so I'm sure you're thinking, well, this sounds good, Jay, but what are we actually doing today? I shall tell you exactly what we're doing. Um, we are going to open a model. I'm personally going to be using Rhino for this, but again, I can talk to you through the process of how you could achieve the same results from SketchUp, Vectorworks, Revit. So if anyone has any preference, let me know in the chat. I'll happily talk through those as well. Um, if not, I'll skip those. And essentially, I'm going to show you how you can extract technical drawings from these. So plans, sections, elevations, as well as kind of isometric views and plan obliques as well. And then I'll show you my process for getting these into Illustrator so we can make these a bit more diagrammatic. We can adjust things like line weights, create interesting line types. We can create pattern fills and things. And then I'll show you my process for getting these into uh, Photoshop to scale with infinite resolution. So I'm sure all of you at some point have had really lovely drawings that you've produced in a CAD package, and then you've brought it into Photoshop, most likely, uh, maybe to do a bit of coloring or maybe some shadow and light work. And then when you've exported it out, it's been pretty much pixelated. I don't know if anyone's ever had that issue, but if you have, by all means, type in the chat and say, I've had that. Because um, I know as a student, I definitely had those issues. So again, I'm going to be going through uh, a bunch of that kind of process today how to achieve this. So first of all, I have a 3D model. Hopefully everyone can see my screen OK. And again, for anyone who's just joined, if you want to use the same 3D model, I have uploaded it to Teams under this meeting. If you navigate to the Files tab at the top, you can download the same 3DM file I'm going to use. Um, and the kind of end output, we want to have something that looks a bit like this. So something really clean, diagrammatic, and informative. So first things first, um, I have my clean 3D model. I'm going to put this onto rendered mode. And as you can see, I've, I've not applied any materials or textures to this. I've just kept it nice and clean for now. Um, and it actually doesn't matter if you have this on rendered or shaded, but I do recommend you have it on one of those two. I'm going to put this back to shaded. Now, thing to begin with, I'm going to look at ex extracting the standard drawing types, so plan, section, and elevation. So let's start with elevation first. So firstly, if I bring this back to my top view, or my third angle orthographic, I should say, so top, front, and right, you can see quite clearly I can see my top view, or essentially plan view, my front view, and my right view. So from my front view and my right view, I can, of course, extract uh, elevation drawings. From my top view, I could, of course, extract my plans. So the key thing with Rhino, and this will work as well if you're importing models from other software, and I recommend you do because Rhino does this so, so nicely. Um, what I recommend you do is select your model. So I've selected mine in front view. In fact, let's maximize this a minute. So I've just maximized my front view. I'm just selecting the model and I'm going to type in the command make 2D. Make 2D is probably my favorite command in Rhino. It just works. And for those of you that are using older versions of Rhino, like Rhino 5, Rhino 6, make 2D has been significantly updated in Rhino 7. It now handles every geometry type, including sub D, mesh, just everything. Does it much, much nicer and faster. Um, right, I've got my front view uh, selected. The type of projection I want to extract is this view. So I'm going to keep that set to view. 
My object properties, I want it to inherit those from the input objects, because I've selected these. And then lastly, I just need to choose um, what type of geometry I'm extracting. And you can kind of get an idea of what these are going to be by toggling them on and off and watching what happens in this little uh, icon box just there. So for instance, if I turn off the tangent edges, I still get the scene silhouette, but any, any kind of extra NURBS curves that help uh, define an object would be removed if I turn that off. So again, I get a bit of control over what line work is extracted. Same thing with the silhouette. I could tell it to create one continuous line type as a border around objects. That's of course really, really useful if I want a thicker outline to separate something from the rest. So I'm going to keep that on actually. I probably want to group the output so I can move it around a bit easier. And then the final thing we need to decide is whether we want to enable hidden lines. So if I enable hidden lines, I'll get these really uh, faint hidden lines to see the rest of the geometry, all the back faces. So I'm actually going to turn that off for now, because typically for a section drawing, we just want to see what's visible. We don't want to be able to see through objects. So I recommend you just take a quick screenshot of those settings. I'll leave that on the screen for five seconds. Take a quick uh, screenshot. These are the settings I used most commonly. There we go. And when you're ready, I'm just going to click on OK. That's going to do some processing and it's already extracted the drawing. But at the moment, all I'm seeing is what looks like a yellow line selected. And the reason for that is it's going to extract our 3D view and it's going to lay it out in 2D in our top view. So if you imagine our top view, our X and Y axis as being like a piece of paper that we're looking down on, it's going to extract our drawing and lay it out onto that. I'm just going to use these arrows to move it out of the way. And if you're new to Rhino, if you don't have those arrows, you can enable that by clicking on the gumball button just at the bottom. There's this one just here, toggling on and off. And if you're on Mac, your gumball button will be at the top of the screen. So let's just zoom into this for a sec. Let's have a look, see what we got. So if I deselect it, you see I have a drawing like this. Now, at the moment on my model uh, or my drawing, all of this line work is all different colors, so probably not ideal. And the reason it's all different colors is that when I told it to make a 2D, I told it to inherit all of the input uh, geometry. So for instance, uh, these walls are all purple, the floor is gray, the glass is this greeny turquoisey color, and it's preserved all of that information because I told it to. If you don't want it to do that, you could obviously change your make 2D settings to basically not inherit the input. We'll do that in a minute. Um, or you could just select your geometry afterwards. And in your properties panel, you could just change your display color, set it to black. And that keeps all your line work nice and clean, nice and black. Now I'm just going to pause that there for a minute because I know some of you said you wanted to uh, have a go at following this live. And again, if you want me to repeat that process, I'm happy to do so. But if you want to give that a go yourself now, you're more than welcome to. In fact, let me do a make 2D of this elevation. So I'm doing my right view this time. So for anyone who's just joined, I'm going to select my model, type in the command make 2D. It will remember the same settings that we had before. So again, I can toggle these on and off and watch what happens in the box to see what options, options I'm going to get. Um, and I could, of course, choose um, what object properties to inherit. So if I wanted to bring in all of the colors from the current objects, I keep from input objects. If I want it to all be defined um, as a single color, I choose by output layers. Click OK. That's going to process. We navigate to our top view and just move our drawing out of the way. So it looks very basic at the moment because it is. You know, we're extracting basic drawings from a very basic looking building. Uh, and I'm, of course, doing this deliberately 
just in case anyone has um, like a really slow computer uh, or if it's your first time ever engaging with Rhino, just want to keep it nice and simple for now. But you can do this with any, any level of complexity. So you could have the most complex urban master plan ever, and this would still work. And for those of you that came from the workshop we ran a couple of hours ago, again, you can load up the same model if you were following along at the same time. And uh, this would work exactly the same way on that as well. Nice big urban master plan. So again, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes. And if you have any questions, by all means, shout them out. There's not many of us today, so happy to uh, take a few questions. We'll come back to this in about 60 seconds. Probably should have mentioned as well, for those of you that didn't download a model, or if you just want something to quickly extract some drawings from, you know, you could just quickly do uh, some block volumes just with the cube tool. Just stretch some shapes out. Same process. Just to give you something to kind of play with. You know, something like that could be a bit kind of interesting. I think that's probably your 60 seconds up anyway. Um, right. So that is the easiest one, uh, the elevations. The next step would be to do a plan. So plans get a little bit more tricky. So the reasons uh, plans get tricky, uh, essentially just because um, we need to extract our plans at a specific height above each floor level. So we're going to talk about that in a sec. But I'm going to show you the way that most people would tend to extract plans. Just seeing there's a question in the chat. Do the lines and thicknesses scale automatically or is it a setting? Um, yeah, they'll kind of scale automatically at the moment, I believe. So if I zoom in and out, those line thicknesses currently stay in proportion to the rest of the drawing. We're not going to worry about line weights here. Uh, essentially, we're going to be playing with our line weights when we get to Illustrator. Or you could do it in AutoCAD, but we're going to use uh, Illustrator today for a reason. And I'll explain that reason in a bit. So at the moment, if we just compare this to our 3D view, currently we have all of the roofs and things on here. Yeah. If I were to extract a make 2D in my top view at the moment, keep the settings the same as before, and click OK. It's going to process. It's extracted a nice clean vector drawing of my top view. But at the moment, it's currently um, not able to look through to the interior because my roofs are in the way. Now, what a lot of people tend to do is to turn their roofs off, which is OK to an extent. I could select a roof and type in there the command hide, or I could find the roof layer and I could turn it off. There is actually a roofs layer there. Not sure why that one's not on it. So essentially, I could turn the roofs off by selecting them and typing in the command hide or turning the layer off for the roofs. And you'll see that if I were to do a make 2D, from my 3D model in top view now. Let that generate. We're now able to see inside the building. I can always align these nicely after. I'm not going to worry too much about getting it accurate right now. There's quite a quick way just to create a quick, a quick clean vector drawings um, just from your 3D models. So I know some of you would. Uh, blah, blah. Though some of you do prefer to work straight in 3D and then extract things out, obviously we should work in 2D first and extrude into 3D. But again, there are reasons why sometimes we would do it in reverse, especially if we're doing it for like a diagrammatic purpose or maybe, for instance, if I wanted to do a lighting plan or a fire plan or something like that, I wouldn't necessarily need a construction drawing for that. Maybe I want something just a bit more visual. Or maybe I just want to color and texture this, for instance, do a rendered plan uh, to communicate to a client, in which case construction drawings are not the way to go. We would just do it as a, a quick extraction like this. And of course, because we're extracting these, you know, I can select all of these lines and it's all vector geometry. It's all lines and polylines, meaning that essentially they're vectors, which means they have an infinite resolution. 
which is pretty fantastic. So that's one way to extract the plans. Now, the problem with this is that we're not extracting them at the correct height. So we're just kind of guessing what height to extract these from at the moment. So to extract these at the correct height, which is 1.5 meters above the level that we are trying to capture based on British drawing standards, um, essentially we would want to add a clipping plane. And the best way to explain clipping planes is actually to do a section. So let's say, for instance, I wanted to create a section that runs, um, let's say I wanted to run along here. In fact, let's move that. Let's, let's say I wanted to run through these stairs just so we can see it's cutting through. You don't need to draw this line. I'm just using it as a reference. Um, if I wanted to cut that way, I would need to obviously find the longest edge of the model, which is going to be my front view. In here, I would type in the command clipping plane because I want to clip this view. So clipping plane. I'm going to type in enter or hit enter even. And now with my clipping plane tool enabled, I'm just going to draw a rectangle over my object. And a few things have happened. So the first thing you'll notice is something's happened to this drawing in my front view. It's now kind of given this a bit of a thicker outline. We're not fully sure what this means yet, but I'm guessing that's where it's clipped through. Um, if I zoom out a little bit in my 3D view, I can also see that it's got this little boundary just here. This plane, this is my clipping plane. And if I view it in my top view, I can also see where that clipping plane is too. So let's say I move this clipping plane. Watch what happens in my front view as I move the clipping plane in the top view. It's allowing me to cut through my model and anything between me, imagine I'm standing over here, anything between me and this clipping plane is going to be hidden. And we'll only see whatever's past that clipping plane. So for instance, it's cutting through there, so I can only see that part, which is this remaining wall. So it's a really nice way to quickly find sections. Now in this context, I want it to slice through these stairs and through this front swimming pool type thing. I know it's not a swim, swimming pool, it's just a pool. Um, I always call it a swimming pool. But essentially, once I've got this set up, I can do the same process again that I used to extract my elevation. So I'm going to select my uh, drawing, my model in my front view. I probably want to deselect the clipping plane itself. So I'm going to hold control and click on the clipping plane in my front view so that just this is selected. And then it's the same process again. So make 2D. Same settings as before. You don't need to enable hidden line. Just keep it the same as it was. Click OK. That's going to process. And again, in our top view, we've now got a section. So let's make that bigger and take a look. So again, pretty easy stuff. And of course, you know, it's a bit difficult to tell at the moment that it's a section, but we can get an idea that it is because we're able to see the profile of the stairs. We can see the cutout of where the pool is. And essentially anything in here, anything that we've sliced through, we would probably then fill in with like a solid black hatch or maybe uh, like a nice diagonal hatch to represent that we're cutting through a solid boundary. But that's something that we're going to add later. We're not going to add those ourselves right now. So hopefully you understand what's happening with um, that clipping plane. And just while we're talking about clipping planes, another thing people uh, may not know, if you deselect a clipping plane and then select it again, go to properties, you can tell it what view that clipping plane can be active in. So for instance, I could now enable it in perspective. And now I can move that around to clip my 3D views. So this is really useful also during the design process where you're working on something, especially if you just want to move something out of the way. Now I'm just going to disable that. I do recommend as well to uh, either hide or delete clipping planes once you've uh, finished using them, or at least make everything visible. 
So just coming back to our top view, I said about extracting a plane uh, or a, a plan, sorry, 1.5 meters above the ground level for the, the view that we're trying to extract. So what I essentially mean by that is in our top view, I want to create a clipping plane. You see, I've got my roofs and ceilings and stuff on, at least I should do. There we go. In my top view, I'm going to make a clipping plane. Something like that. Currently, obviously, I can't see the whole building because it's pretty much at ground level. But what we can do with our object snaps enabled, our end snap, I'm going to use the move tool. So I'm going to type in M for move. I'm just going to move it from the corner of the clipping plane, snap it to the corner of the floor. So at least now they're aligned. So for instance, my clipping plane is now aligned with the floor. And again, if we're, if we're following British drawing standards, we know that a plan is typically extracted 1.5 meters above the floor finish level. So that means now that it's aligned to the floor, we can move it up by 1500 millimeters. So I'm just using the move tool, moving it upwards. And now my clipping plane is in the correct location to extract a genuine plan. In which case we now do the same thing. So in our top view, we select the model. We hold control and deselect the plane. We type in make 2D and click OK. And now we've got ourselves a nice accurate plan. And we can see uh, things like the furniture and stuff like that in there. It's a, it's a much more accurate representation of how a plan should be extracted. And of course, you know, it's not going to be like Vectorworks or Revit, where you can see construction details inside walls. They're not parametric objects that have been defined. It's not going to give you all the construction details. All it's going to give you is kind of outer boundaries of things. There are plugins you can install to give you those options. If you go to foodforrhino.com, uh, you can download um, kind of BIM tools for Rhino to get the same functionality, but it's just not what Rhino is built for. So I'm just going to delete that clipping plane. So, so far in the space of about 15 minutes, we've extracted two elevations, uh, two floor plans, a ceiling plan and a section. That's pretty good going. But I think we can take it a step further. What about some isometric projections? Well, let's have a look. So if I go to my perspective view, at the moment we have uh, we have a nice 3D view, but we have perspective distortion, which is OK, but it's not quite what we're going for. We want to extract something a bit more diagrammatic. And this is the one that I'm going to be bringing to Illustrator today. So for this, I'm going to remove the perspective distortion. I'm going to click on the drop down for my perspective. I'm going to go to set view. And you see in set view, we have isometric. And I should note that there are two ways to go about this. If you're doing an isometric uh, projection where we're projecting at 30 degrees, this is how you would create these. If you're doing a plan oblique, or what we call uh, axonometric, some of you may know it as axos. Uh, this isn't the way we would do this. I'll show you a separate method uh, for doing those after. But essentially, you just need to choose your view. So for instance, NE is northeast, which makes us view our model from this angle. Don't like that one. I want to see some stairs. I'm going to try northwest. Nope, still not the angle I'm looking for. I'm going to go southeast and perfect. There we go. This is the kind of view I'm looking for, something where I can see a change in floor levels. Just makes it that bit more three dimensional. So if I've got something like this, obviously I'm already in um, orthographic because I've set this to an isometric view. I've zoomed into my model. If I want to turn this into a vector drawing, well, I can still do that now really, really easily. Same process as before. I'll just select the drawing or select the model, type in make 2D. Again, exact same settings as previous, so I'm just going to click OK. And obviously it looks a bit weird in this view because we're looking at the drawing isometrically. But same as all the others, if we come back to our top view, I can now just move that drawing out of the way. 
And now I've got a nice clean isometric drawing of my site. And of course, this is completely flat. This is ready to put into AutoCAD, ready to put into Illustrator. You can line weight this, you can texture it, you can do whatever you want. And the good thing about Make 2D as well is that it removes uh, duplicate curves. So you're never going to have weird overlapping lines. You're always going to have nice, clean geometry. I'm um, just going to pause that there for a second. Does anyone have any questions before I move to the next stage? Again, you can either type into the chat or you can shout out. No, looks like we're all good. Oh, got a little bit stuck on the floor plan. OK, um, anything in particular you want me to talk about about the floor plan? Try to hide the roof. Ah, you don't know how to bring the roof back. Is that the issue? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you can hear me. Can you hear oh, me? I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Um, basically, I hid the roof and then um, sort of got the floor plan to get underneath the roof, you know, the floor yep. plan underneath the roof. And it didn't work for some reason. I'm using a Mac, so I'm not sure if that makes a difference. But um, so I hid the roof in the perspective, I think, and then um, made 2D, I think it is, to get the floor plan. But it, it just didn't do it without the roof still. Even I hit the roof. It still did it, it with the roof. Yeah, it just didn't hide the roof. It could be if if you potentially had it selected first. So for instance, if you sorry, if you had the roof selected and then hid it and still did the make 2D, that could potentially uh, cause the issue. But essentially, as long as it's hidden, as long as it's not visible. If I hide it now, for instance. If yeah, I, I'll try it as you do it, yeah. Yeah, okay. If I just hide all of those, as long as it looks like this in 3D view, um, when you do the make 2D, it should work. All right, so it, I've had to hide it twice, yeah. Okay. And then how do you get it back? <laughs> all right, if you want to bring it back, just type in the command show. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. And then it'll yeah. bring them back. Yeah. So it hit the roof. I, I just had to do it twice maybe because I'm using a map. Um, That's fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. I think I actually okay. had the same issue with mine. Now I think about it. In fact, I've yeah. just lost the roof. Anyway. Yeah. I think on this one, I think it was actually an exploded model for some reason. Yeah. Uh, for instance, when I type in hide on that, it's still got another one underneath, which is a bit of a problem. So yeah, that's just yeah, my absolutely. bad modeling. <laughs> I apologize. No, no, that's fine. No, that's fine. I should have just tried again. I don't know. I, I think I did it and then I pressed Control Z and tried it again. I thought, oh, it's not working. <laughs> that's fair so, enough. Yeah. Well, hopefully that's Thank working you. now. Yeah. No worries. Uh, right, just going to come back to these questions in the chat. How do you avoid collisions between lines? Um, oh, and it's extended further down. When a new thing is created, it overlaps on top of the original. Is there any way to control the image is oh where the image is pasted? So that's a good question, actually. So typically, every time you do a make 2D, uh, in fact, if I do a make 2D of this, every time you do a make 2D, it's going to appear at the zero zero coordinates, or at least somewhere close to it. In fact, the zero zero coordinate is there. It should always appear somewhere near it. Um, as far as I know, there's no way to choose where that appears to. But all I would do is after you've made every drawing, uh, while it's still selected, just move it out of the way or move it onto its own layer. So if I go to my layers tab just here, I can make a new one, call it plan drawing, for instance. Right click that layer and choose change object layer with my drawing selected. It just means I can now turn that layer on and off. So when I do my next make 2D, it could still stay in the same location, uh, but I'll be able to differentiate between drawings. So that's how I'll probably navigate that one. Is that OK? Does that answer the question?
Yeah, perfect. Right, in that case, I did say um, that there is one more type of drawing we can extract. Um, so obviously we've done an isometric drawing so far. Uh, but if you wanted to do like a plan oblique, uh, which or, or an axo, as again, some of you may know it as, where we're doing 45 degree projections, currently there's no view set for this. So for instance, there's not a there's not a plan oblique option for this. But essentially the way that plan obliques work or axos work, are that each of these uh, projection lines is going to be 45 degrees. And we're also going to be kind of tilting the camera down at it to look at it at 45 degrees as well. And there's a little bit of a hack to create this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to copy this whole model because what we need to do, we need to destroy the model for this to work. And what I'm going to do, I'm just going to select the whole model, type in copy. I'm just going to move it out of the way. So for those of you that are doing the same thing, I want you just to copy and move it up to here. So it's not going to be in the same line of sight as this one. It's not in the same line of sight that way. It's just over here out of the way. And you'll see why in a minute. Now in my top view, what I'm going to do, I'm going to select that whole model, the one I've just copied. And I'm going to type in rotate. I'm going to choose a point to rotate from. So because I want to be looking at it from where the stairs are, that area is going to be my center of uh, rotation. So that's my center of rotation, point to rotate from. And then I'm going to type in an angle. And you see if I type in 45, currently it's rotating the wrong way. But if I type in minus 45, it'll do it the other way. And I'm just going to hit enter. So essentially what I've done, I've just rotated that drawing around 45 degrees. And what this allows us to do is given us these projection lines that way of 45 degrees, projection lines that way of 45 degrees. But at the moment, we're still looking down at it in top view uh, completely flat. You know, there's no there's no angled uh, distortion to this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to select the object. And just to make sure I'm editing the right one, once I've selected it, I'm going to type in the command ZSA, zoom selected all, and hit enter. And this allows me just to uh, basically zoom into the object I have selected. It's really, really useful. So we've got this set up correctly in our top view. You know, it's, it's 45 degree angles there, 45 degree angle there. But now what we want to do is we actually want to destroy the model. We want to skew it so that it's kind of at an angle of 45 degrees. Uh, and I have seen people using the rotate command for this to try and rotate it 45 degrees. It just doesn't quite work correctly. So what I'm going to do in my right view, I'm going to select the model. And I'm going to type in the command skew, S-K-E-W. Oh no, don't tell me they got rid of it in Rhino 7. If, it, if skew doesn't work, try shear. Shear basically does the same as skew. Type in the command shear. Yeah, that's going to work. So I've selected the object, the whole model in my right view, the one that I copied and pasted. I've typed in the command shear. It's now asking me for an origin point, which is going to be the very bottom left part of the model. And as you'll see in my top view, you'll kind of just see it highlight the point. And it's this furthest lowest down point. So I'm going to click that. My reference point is just going to be straight up slightly above the model. And the same thing again, I'm going to type in 45. But if it's going the wrong direction, which it is, I'm going to type in minus 45. And you see what it's doing? It's skewing the model. It's shearing it by 45 degrees. So firstly, in 3D view, this very clearly looks wrong. In my right view, all my walls are wonky. But in my top view, I now have a perfect plan oblique. And of course, that means in my top view, I can select my model, type in the command make 2D, click OK. That's going to process. And now further down near my origin, near my 00, zero coordinate, I've now got my plan oblique drawing. 
And as you see, if we compare that side by side to the ISO, we've got this isometrical, isometrical with, uh, sorry, you can't get my words out, isometric with 30 degree angles and our plan oblique with 45 degree angles. So two different options for extracting 3D views. Question in the chat, is there a way to do an exploded axonometric slash isometric of the building? Yes, there is. And that is why this mode is super easy. I'm just going to delete that one that we just destroyed. You see, I've got the destroyed one there and the original model down here. I'm just going to delete the broken one that we just uh, skewed and stretched. I'm going to zoom into the good one with ZSA. Now, if you wanted to do an exploded um, isometric, I would simply put it back to the view we had before. So isometric southeast. That seemed to work really nicely for me. And the great thing about this is um, you can essentially just select objects and move them upwards. So for instance, if I wanted to select this roof, in fact, all of the roofs, um, if they're all on the shared layer, you can just select the roofs and using the blue arrow, we can move things up on the z-axis. I'm just going to remove that surface. There we go. Uh, and likewise, if I wanted to remove uh, all of the base, I could select that. And some of you might prefer working in uh, multiple views at once for this. So for instance, I could have all of my walls, select all of the roofs as well, move them up on the z-axis. Maybe I'll do the same thing with all of the terrain as well. Just go, I've got all the stairs and stuff in there. Maybe I'll move those ones downwards. Ah, I forgot the pane of water. Always do it. Any little outliers that you don't want, just remove. And so essentially you've got your nice exploded view. And as long as you're in one of these isometrics like southeast or northeast or whatever, there's going to be a true ISO. And then same thing again. Select your drawing, make 2D, click OK. And then in your top view, you've now got your exploded drawing. And the great thing about this is um, before you bring it into Illustrator, because I'm guessing most of you will prefer drawing in CAD packages, we can just um, basically use the line tools and just draw in our uh, projection lines, especially because we have ortho mode. It's much easier to draw here. So for instance, I know this roof comes and sits down around about there. I can just use the trim tool afterwards. So something like that. That will project down to around there. That's going to project around about down to there. Uh, any areas that we want to remove, of course, just use the trim tool. So cutting object is going to be this one and this one. Hit enter. Bit to trim away is the bit in between. And now it makes that bit more three dimensional. So it's a nice way to quickly create these exploded drawings. And of course, it doesn't look very clean at the moment, doesn't look very nice. And the reason for that is because all of the line types are the same, all of the colors are the same, and all of the line thicknesses are the same. But once we bring this into Illustrator, again, we can make this a bit more diagrammatic. Um, the other thing to mention as well is if you were going to create like a Bjark Ingle style uh, visual, if I just pull up the original one, um, you know, notice as well that these tend to have light and shadow communicated. So alongside extracting these drawings, you might also want to uh, either extract like a render or something like that, uh, just of your model. So if I put this into rendered mode, it doesn't look very nice at the moment, but I could go to my render drop down, go to environment editor, Go to my sun, and just turn it on. So if I turn on manual control, essentially what this allows me to do is I can raise my sun up. And I can set the orientation to adjust things like shadows across the site. I think at the moment there's another sun in there. Yep. If I go to my, my lights tab, I just need to turn off the skylight that's in there. There we go. Yeah, so we get a bit more control over adjusting the light on the model. 
even just something kind of like that, just to kind of differentiate it. And obviously this is just the standard Rhino render uh, that we're using here. Rhino render is not very nice, if I'm honest. Uh, but if you're combining this with something like V-Ray, or if you're using Enscape, Lumion, Twinmotion, any of those, you can obviously do a much nicer job of the lighting than this. V-Ray is the one I'd recommend if you can uh, afford a license for it. Um, right, I think that's pretty much that. If you wanted to extract this, just so we can use uh, the light and shadow as an overlay later, um, the one I would type in is view capture to file. Because what this allows you to do, brings up this panel here, it allows you to export your window or whatever's in your view, and it allows you to set the resolution to custom, and you can type in custom sizes in pixels. So you can get as infinitely high resolution as you need to. Much better than printing as a PDF or anything like that. And it allows you to also do it with transparency. So if you don't have anything in the background, you can have this already chopped out, already cut out to bring into Photoshop. So for instance, in this context, I've clicked on the drop down and chosen custom. Um, I'm not going to bother setting a scale. I'm just going to increase the resolution. This is roughly 4K resolution at the moment. When I'm happy, I'll click OK, uh, give it a name, and again, I'll save it as a PNG if you wanted to do it with transparency. Um, let's chuck it into there. So just to kind of see what that looks like, um, it's this one just there. I think I might still be saving. Ah, luckily it's still previewed it with a white background, that's nice. Uh, when you bring this into Photoshop, that will come up with transparency. Have a feeling you might also need to tick alpha channel or something. Yeah, tick the button that says transparent background. That's going to help. <laughs> and then when you export as a PNG, it will come up transparent. There we go. Right, now that we've extracted a bunch of drawings and some information with light and shadow, we now need to start extracting these. And I'm not going to do the exploded one, actually. I think I'm actually, no, you know what? Let's do the exploded one. I'm going to take this exploded drawing and I'm going to bring this into Illustrator. So I'm going to select the drawing. I'm going to go to File, Export Selected, choose the location to save. Um, I'm going to call this exploded ISO 1. And the file type I want to save it as is AutoCAD Drawing Exchange. DXF. And if ever you're um, basically exchanging drawings between packages, always, always do them as a DXF. It's literally in the name, AutoCAD Drawing Exchange. So it's always good for 2D stuff. So I've chosen the location, saving it as a DXF, clicking Save. The option in the drop down I would choose is 2007 polylines. Out of all of my years of trying different options, this is the one that's given me the best results consistently. So I'm going to do 2007 polylines. Then I click OK. So now that's done, that's the end of Rhino. Now it's all just straight into Illustrator and Photoshop. And I would say if the end goal is Photoshop, still bring it into Illustrator first just to get the high resolution. So now that we've done that, I'm going to open Illustrator. I am a bit aware of time. I know we're supposed to be finishing in 10 minutes. Um, it might go slightly over. If anyone needs to go, obviously, you're more than welcome to. Um, sorry, too many screens as always. Right, when you've got Illustrator open, I would just click on New File. Um, it's completely up to you what you set your page size as, but typically, if you're doing something like this, you're probably going to be working to some standard page sizes unless it's for web uh, stuff that you're creating. Let's say, for instance, I want to do this to A3. I would just go to print, find my A3. Or if I'm choosing a bigger template, I would just look online for what the dimensions are for A2, A0, A1, or whatever. Type in my dimensions over here. And set your orientation to either landscape or portrait. I'd also recommend that for any raster effects, you set this to high, 300 points per inch. Just always good practice. And lastly, you can adjust your color mode as well, just down here. 
if if the option sorry if the final output is going to be for print set this to cmyk if the final output is going to be for uh, uploading for web for presentations any kind of computer viewing keep this to rgb i'm just going to leave it on cmyk for now so i'm going to click on create so you should end up with something like this um chances are if you're not used to using um illustrator your illustrator is probably just going to look like this by default so you're not going to have that ribbon along the top so the first thing we're going to do before we bring the drawing in is click on window workspace essentials classic and all this does it just brings the ribbon back at the top um i know there's other ways of working uh, that are a bit more modern but most of the tutorials you'll find for Illustrator on YouTube will have this ribbon. And to be honest, I'm probably just a bit old school. I've been using this for a bit over 20 years, which is insane now I think about it. Um, and yeah, essentially, I'm just used to working this way. I find it easier to be able to adjust my colors, my line thicknesses and everything all in the same panel. So I need to bring my drawing in. I'm going to go to File and I'm going to go to Place. Place is essentially import. Uh, navigate to our save the file too. And we should find the exploded ISO 1.dxf. Now, before you double click and place it, you're going to want to show import options. This one just down here and click on place. Now you get the option to adjust the scale. And there's a few ways we could go about this. So for instance, if I scaled my drawing down first by using scale factors in Rhino, then when I export it into Illustrator, I would tell it to preserve the original size because I would have already scaled it in AutoCAD or Illustrator, not Illustrator, AutoCAD or Rhino or Vectorworks or whatever. If it's still one-to-one -one scale, it's obviously not going to fit on the page, in which case I could either scale it down by a scale factor or I could just tell it to scale to fit artboard to make it as big as possible if I don't need to worry about scale. So again, just something for you to consider when you're bringing drawings in. I'm personally not going to worry about scale right now because I'm going to do this for uh, presenting on the web. I'm not actually going to print this one out. So I'm just going to tell it to scale to fit the artboard. Click OK. Click in the top left corner of the page. It might take a bit of time for it to process, but it will then bring the drawing in. And you may need to drag the corners to scale it. And you may need to hold shift to scale it proportionally. Now, for some of you, when you deselect it, it may completely disappear, in which case, don't worry, I'll show you how to fix that. Uh, for some of you, when you deselect it, it may stay there, which is obviously ideal. If yours disappeared, if, if it looks like it's fine when it's selected, let's say it looks like this, but then when you deselect it, it disappears. It just means you need to adjust your uh, colors. So the box is in the top left. We have our fill color to fill the shapes in with colors. We have the stroke color, which is our line color. So this second box, this one just here, I'm just going to set that to black. And now we have our drawing visible. In fact, I'm just going to drag this over uh, just a little bit. Try to anyway, just so it's in the middle of the sheet a bit better. There we go. So there's not a huge amount we need to do to this, to be honest. And um, we've already done most of the work in Rhino. But there's a few things we can do just to make this a bit prettier. So first thing I would do is select it and you'll see the whole thing is grouped together. I can't get to individual lines. So with it all selected, I'm going to go to object. I'm going to go to ungroup. I'm going to go back to object. I'm going to click on group a second time. And I'm just going to keep on doing it until I can't ungroup it any further. And what this lets you do is select objects individually, something like this. Much, much nicer to work with. The second thing I would do is lower the line weights down, make the line weights much, much slimmer. Because at the moment, this looks very heavy, looks very nasty. So I'm going to select the whole drawing. And up here where we have the stroke, currently the stroke is one point in thickness. 
If I click on the drop down, I'm just going to start at the smallest one, which is 0 0.25. Let's take a look at that now. Instantly looks much, much more detailed. So it's the same amount of geometry as before, but because it's not as heavy, it looks more detailed. Now, in order to bring this to life, we now need a bit of contrast. And we can do that by introducing varying line weights and varying line types. So for instance, if I zoom in on this piece up here, I'm just going to select it and press Control plus to zoom in. If I wanted this to have a bit of a thicker outline, I could just hold my shift button, go around and click all of these outer edges and just increase the stroke. So I've just put that up to 0.75. I missed out the two little edge ones just there. It's 0.75. And you see just, just something like this makes it look so much more diagrammatic, so much nicer to look at. Likewise, when I'm zoomed out this far, probably can't see a huge amount of difference in those, which means I probably need to thicken that up a little bit more. But if I'm viewed, viewing this from this kind of distance, it really does make a difference. And it just creates that kind of sense of hierarchy between the elements of a drawing. So for instance, I'm going to go around, just select some of these key lines. And I like that. Give that a bit of a thicker outline. And you kind of see what I'm getting at with this. It's just much, much nicer. Any lines like this, I'll just zoom into this one. Any lines like this, for instance, at the moment, it's a single line connecting over there down to here. This is obviously a bit of a problem because if I try and thicken this at the moment, it's not going to work very nicely. It's going to create this weird overlap. So I want to split this up. And cutting things in Illustrator is something everyone struggles with for some reason. Um, but essentially, we've got some tools over on the left. There's a few ones we could use. Um, I would actually recommend that you go to where the eraser tool is. And if you click and hold on it, go to the scissors tool. And the scissors tool essentially splits objects. So select the object you want to split first, which is this line. Use the scissors. Where this line intersects it, just click. And now that line should be two separate segments. So now I can select just that piece. Much, much nicer. Now, of course, you know, there are tons of different ways we can go about quickly selecting objects. I'll show you the shape builder tool in a second as well. I just want to quickly throw that out there just to give you an idea. Now, I'm obviously not going to have time to go around and do this entire drawing, but I just want to quickly show you how you can quickly adjust all the line weights after once you've gone around and differentiated them. So let's say I've gone around, I've set all of the thicker line weights, and then I've realized actually, maybe I want these a bit thicker after all. Rather than going around and doing them all manually again, you could select just that single line weight. Then you can go to select same stroke weight. And now anything that has the same stroke weight will be selected. And anything that's different will not be selected. So if I were to thicken this up, I can now increase that to maybe one point deselect, and now those lines are even thicker. So again, it's a fast way to work. And likewise, you know, we can see this is a good way to add in some contrast, add a bit more kind of detail to it. The other way I said was to introduce uh, different line types. And so for me, the different line types would be, uh, for instance, creating projection lines or arrows maybe. So if you've drawn these in Rhino, you could just select them and go straight to adjusting them here. If not, you could just draw in some uh, projection lines, uh, you know, just click and drag them down. You can hold in shift to snap if you want. It'll give you the exact same end output. But what I'm going to do for this is select my lines. I'm just going to select a single one to begin with, just so you can see what's happening. Select a line. And over here on the right, you should have these three lines that say stroke. And if you don't have those, you can go to window and you can enable stroke here. And that should bring the panel, the stroke panel up. Now, by default, the stroke panel is minimized. So if I click on those three lines for stroke, 
Currently, all I can see is the stroke weight. It only gives me the same option I have at the top. But if I click on the second mini lot of three lines just on the corner and do show options, suddenly I get so much more options for adjusting my stroke. So now I can adjust not only the thickness, but also the end caps. Like for instance, is it going to chamfer edges? Is it going to round them out? Uh, maybe I want to turn this into a dashed line, in which case I'll just click on dashed and straight away it becomes a dashed line. It's a lovely way to work. If I wanted to adjust the spacing between the dashes, for instance, I can adjust that just here. So for instance, it's 12 point for my dashes. If I set that down to six and then click off of it, you see I now get a much finer looking dash. So it's a really, really nice way to work. It's, it's pretty fantastic. So all of these other projection lines, for instance, um, let me just zoom over here a little bit. I only made a single one there annoyingly. All of these, I could just do them all at once, make them a dashed line, give them a thickness or a spacing, and straight away it looks that bit more diagrammatic. And again, if I wanted to add some direction to these, I can click on the lines themselves, and I can even add arrowheads, or I could stylize, stylize these. So with this line selected, in fact, let's select all of those again. These lines selected, I could click on the arrowheads, uh, drop down. And in fact, that's going the wrong direction. I can just see it's added little arrowheads at the top. I actually want them at the bottom. So I'm just going to choose none for that first one. I'm going to add an arrowhead for the second one. And then we've got different scale boxes for each end of those. If my arrowheads are too small, I just increase the scale. So it's currently 100%. I type in 500%. I now get these nice arrows. Or if I don't want arrows, maybe I want something else. You know, I could have these nice circles, for instance. Please don't ever use these nasty hands. They're, they just look cheap. Uh, you know, there's so many options for things that you could add in into this, just to make it a bit more interesting. Um, and of course, you know, you can even adjust like the uh, the profile of the line. It doesn't have to be one straight uh, consistent thickness. You could also have it so uh, the, the thickness changes. So let's say, for instance, just if I was doing like a flow diagram or something, if I use the curvature tool. If I'm trying to show how someone might circulate a site, maybe I can just use the curvature tool just to show there we go, just to show how someone might navigate. With my stroke panel open, maybe I'm going to make this a bit thicker. In fact, let's make this nice and thick. I'm not going to make it dashed, but maybe I'm going to adjust the profile. So something kind of like this. Obviously, it doesn't look very nice at the moment, but obviously I can then start adding arrows and things to it on one end. It's a nice way just to quickly draw something coming through the site. Now I can obviously scale this down massively. Choose a different profile than that because that's horrible. Flip that direction. There we go. It just makes it look that little bit more interesting. And then it's up to you how you then start coloring this or filling it with texture, etc. Um, in fact, let's delete that. That's a horrible one. One more thing you could do as well is fill things with texture. So let's say, for instance, I want to make this a little bit more interesting. Maybe I want to fill this boundary here with a texture. At the moment, that looks like an absolute nightmare to do. I'm sure you can all agree because we've got loads of separate lines. I haven't isolated a boundary. It just looks like a pain. An easy way to do it is just to select that whole drawing there. Over here on the left, there is the shape builder tool which is this one here. It looks like a couple of circles merged together. And you see on the preview how this works. So I'll click on Shape Builder. I can just click and drag, even if I'm not joining any together. I can just click and drag, uh, and you'll see it will highlight the boundary red if it finds a boundary. And now I can select that as an object. So for instance, I can now fill this shape in with a cover. So it's a very fast way to mask things out. 
But if I wanted to fill this with a pattern, for instance, instead of a color, I could click on my fill. And down in the bottom left, I can get to my swatch libraries. And in here, I can get to gradients, I can get to different colors, I can get to patterns. And in fact, if I go to patterns, I can go to lines, for instance. No, it's opened in the wrong screen. There we go. Let me just expand that. Yeah, so for instance, I could choose uh, different patterns to fill this shape with. Something like that, maybe. Let's go for a nice thin one. Something like that. The final thing, just to quickly show you here before we bring this to Photoshop, um, if I didn't like the scale of this pattern or if I wanted to adjust the rotation, easiest way to do that is to select it, go to Object, go to Transform, and then you can access your uh, Move, Rotate, Reflect, Scale, etc. So for instance, if I wanted to rotate this around, I could go to Rotate. By default, it will want to rotate the object, which is the boundary. But if you uh, tell it to transform the pattern instead of the object, if we untick objects, then essentially we can now rotate this around. And you'll see we can preview that as we do it. So the object stays where it is, but the pattern itself changes. So I can rotate that by 45 degrees, for instance. Click OK. Now I've got my, uh, my pattern. And same thing with the scale as well. I can go to transform, I can go to scale. I can, uh, it should recognize that you want to transform the pattern. If I want to make this even smaller, maybe I want to make it 50%. And again, it can just kind of fill it with like a half tone or something. So it's quite a nice way to quickly work. Let's bring it back like that. Now, let's say, let's pretend I've gone through, I've taken the time to lay this out a bit nicer than the way I have. And I've taken the time to adjust all my line weights and things. What I would now want to do to bring this into Photoshop with infinite resolution would be to save this as an Illustrator file. So you don't want to save it as a PNG or a JPEG. Keep it as an Illustrator file. So I'm going to call this one Exploded ISO Illustrator, just so we know which one it is. It's saving as an AI file. Just click OK. You don't need to adjust any settings. So the key thing here is we were working on an A3 page and we've got everything set up here as a vector. And this is where the magic happens. I can now go to Photoshop because I think everyone knows how to use Photoshop these days. It's going to load Photoshop up. As always, it's gone to the wrong screen. There we go. And I'm just going to quickly go to new file. And I'm going to make a document that matches my Illustrator file. It doesn't have to match, but it's just easier if it does. So I'm going to go to 300, uh, sorry, I'm going to go to A3, 300 DPI. It's in portrait orientation. I'm going to click OK or click on create. Now, what we can do is we can tell that Illustrator file to load inside Photoshop. So it's not going to convert it to raster, which is made of pixels. It's going to keep it as vector, where it's mathematically infinite. So to do that, we go to File, and we choose Place Linked. And this only really works well for um, Adobe Geometry, Adobe Files. So for instance, you could place a PDF, and it may work, or you could place a DXF, but it's just not consistent. So I'm going to go and find my Illustrator file. And I'm going to click on Place. Uh, I'm going to tell it to import the entire page. Click OK. And it will bring it into exactly the same location as it is in Illustrator. If I just get these up side by side, I'll show you the genius of this, why we like doing it this way. Um, let's just zoom out slightly. There we go. How do I move along? Yeah, shimmy that. Beautiful. So let's say I've got the two side by side. I've got Photoshop on the left. I've got Illustrator on the right. You obviously don't need to work this way. I just want to show you why I'm doing this. 
let's say for instance um i'd imp i'd imported this the manual way of doing this as a png or jpeg if I realized at the end of all the texturing and everything in Photoshop that actually I want to make some changes to the line work, that would be a complete disaster. But doing it this way means I can modify the vectors here, click on save in Illustrator, and it will automatically update in Photoshop. So let's say, for instance, um, I forgot to outline this piece over here, just as an example. I could go around, shimmy that over. I could select those. I'm going to exaggerate this. I'm going to give this a really thick outline just for a minute. And if I just click on save in Illustrator, come back to Photoshop, that's already updated in my Photoshop file. Absolutely fantastic, completely game changing, massively improves your workflow. It's just brilliant. So especially if like a tutor says to you, actually, I don't like what you've done with this, or you should change these line types or change something, change the scale of your dashes, all of that stuff you can now do directly in Illustrator and it'll update in your Photoshop. And of course, there's a bajillion tutorials out there for updating or applying textures, lighting, shadows, all of that stuff in Photoshop. And remember as well, the only other thing was we extracted something earlier. Um, so let me just bring this back. We extracted this view. Obviously, this is a nasty one. I would probably want to do this on rendered mode rather than shaded. Um, maybe adjust the lighting a bit more so it's a bit lighter. But something with light and shadow. If we did this uh, transparent, which I actually didn't do in the end, you could just bring this into Photoshop, drag that layer onto your other drawing, Put it behind your drawing. In fact, if I just lower the transparency a bit. And essentially, I'll just scale it to fit. In fact, I can make this full screen now. There we go. Don't know why I'm handicapping myself. We could scale this to fit so that it can sit behind all of our nice, clean line work that we're going to be setting up. It might take a little bit of playing with. Something kind of like that. Obviously, I'm winging it at the moment. Not trying to be accurate at all. Something kind of like that. I could, of course, just shimmy it into place a little bit. Beautiful. And then we can just soften these right down, lower the opacity. And you've got some really nice little illustrations starting to appear. Not bad, eh? Obviously, ignore the super thick line. In fact, this upsets me. I'm going to quickly come back to Illustrator just to fix that because that displeases me. Select same stroke weight. I think the final one we used in the end on the others was one point. Click on save. Yeah. Get rid of that. Yeah, come back to Photoshop. That should have updated with it. Not bad. Much, much cleaner. And of course, you know, build yourself up some color palettes, play around with your patterns, your textures. Um, you should be ready to go. Um, interesting one in the chat. Can't edit on Photoshop without rasterizing the image. Um, you shouldn't need to rasterize the image at all. Uh, the only thing I would say, of course, is if you're trying to work on the layer that you've imported, you're not going to be able to do that because it's using, it's basically creating like a smart object. You would have to rasterize it first. But what you could do is make a new layer. And then on that new layer, well, with the original layer selected, you could just like magic wand things. So I could click in there, click on the new layer, and then start working that way. That's how I'll probably go about it. So if I were to brush in some shadow, for instance, um, let's just make that brush a fair bit bigger. Maybe set my flow and smoothing and stuff a bit lower. Yeah, so I'd probably just start. Ah, oh, I probably should have set a different color than this orangey color. I could start painting in and doing things with it, start layering up. And the great thing about doing it this way is the original layer is still there, completely untouched. But I've just got a separate layer on top that I'm essentially masking out. And then you, you can adjust the strength by adjusting your opacities, which is kind of nice. Right, I think that is pretty much it. We're already 15 minutes over the session. 
Um, I don't want to keep you all day. I just wanted to show you that very quick workflow for getting these into um, Photoshop with infinite resolution. And again, you can zoom into these as much as you like um, and you'll never, never uh, see a pixel. You shouldn't have any problems. Uh, final thing, of course, would just be to save your drawings out. Save, save them as PNG where possible. Um, so save a copy. Save them as PNG files, which is portable network graphics, perfect for any kind of CAD produced drawings. So I'm just going to call that number one. Click on save. When that pops up, click OK. And then you can navigate to your folder. Um, there we go, one PNG. Beautiful. There we go. And that should be super, super clean, super, super crisp, no matter how much you zoom into it. Obviously, take more time than me. Don't do it in a space of about 30 minutes. Uh, take time to properly line weight things, color things, get some uh, logic to it. You'll be good to go.